Hi, I'm Shona. I'm the Education and Outreach Manager at Geoscience Australia. Geoscience Australia brings together experts in Australia's geology and geography. In this series, we're going to explore some of Australia's landscapes and landforms. We're going to learn about some of their features and the processes that shape them. We're also going to think about how landscapes and landforms are valued and the ways humans impact and protect them. In this video, we're going to look at desert and semi-arid landscapes and the landforms of Uluru and Katajuta. Arid areas, also known as deserts, and semi-arid areas are pretty special places. But what defines these landscapes? Well, it's all to do with rainfall, or, or lack of rainfall in fact. Deserts and semi-arid areas are defined by being really dry places. Most experts describe desert landscapes as where there's less than 250 millimetres of rainfall each year. And that's a really small amount. Semi-arid areas get a little bit more rainfall, between about 250 and 500 millimetres a year. But they're still really dry places where not many plants grow at all. Compare this with the average yearly rainfall in Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney and Darwin. So let's look at Australia. Did you know 70% of the mainland gets less than 500 millimetres of rain each year? That means most of Australia can be classified as arid or semi-arid. In fact, Australia is the driest inhabited continent in the world. But it's actually Antarctica that's the driest continent overall. Over the whole of the continent, Antarctica only averages about 150 millimetres of precipitation each year. But people don't really live in Antarctica permanently. How many deserts do you think Australia has? You might have heard of the Great Sandy Desert or the Simpson Desert. Well, within the arid, desert region of Australia, there are 10 officially named deserts. What are those? Deserts? I said deserts. Thank you. The biggest desert in Australia is the Great Victoria Desert, followed by the Great Sandy Desert and the Tanami Desert. Then there are all these other ones. These deserts make up about 18% of the entire landmass of Australia. Now that's equivalent to over 62 million football fields the size of the MCG. Amazing! OK, so what shapes desert and semi-arid landscapes? And what landforms are created? Well, I've got three words for you. Weathering, erosion and deposition. Firstly, weathering. Weathering processes cause rocks in the landscape to break down. Weathering can be caused by many things like water, ice, salts, acids, animals and plants. It can also be caused by large ranges in temperature, which can be a feature of desert landscapes. When rocks are repeatedly heated and cooled, the surface can crack and flake away. Next, erosion. Wind and water cause erosion in desert and semi-arid landscapes. Wind can easily pick up and carry sand and dust away, leaving behind heavy rocks. It can also blast and shape surfaces with wind-blown sand. This is how landforms like pedestal rocks and arches are formed. Rain and flash floods can also cause erosion by washing away sand and softer rocks. When flat landforms like plateaus or mazes are eroded, Landforms like buttes can occur. Over a long period of time, water can even create large canyons like this. We call weathered material like sand, silt and gravel sediments. Deposition is when sediments are carried by wind or water and moved to a new location where they're dropped or deposited. When wind picks up and moves sand in deserts and semi-arid landscapes, sand dunes can form. Most of the time, there's no surface water in deserts or semi-arid areas. When rain does fall, rivers flow and lower lakes are filled. When this water dries up, dry lakes form called salt pans or player lakes. 
Most of the time, watercourses are dry and we can see the sediment that was deposited when water flowed. So weathering, erosion and deposition processes create a range of landforms that shape desert and semi-arid landscapes. What other desert landforms can you find out about? In the centre of Australia, in the southern part of the Northern Territory, is Uluru Katajuta National Park. There are a couple of very famous landforms here, and you'll never guess their names. Mm, okay, you probably will. That's right, Uluru and Katajuta. Aboriginal people have lived in the area for at least 30,000 years. The traditional owners speak Yunkanjara and Pijinjara and are known as Ananu. Ananu believe that the Central Australian landscape, including Uluru and Katajuta, was created at the beginning of time by ancestral beings who they are descended from. This area is technically a semi-arid landscape, but it's surrounded by deserts. Not again! Better. According to scientists, these Central Australian landforms started to form about 550 million years ago. Back then, there were no plants living on the land and the dinosaurs wouldn't even appear for another 250 million years. Watch as Science's Nidge explains how Uluru formed. Uluru, the Great Red Rock, one of the most iconic landmarks in Australia. Its colour, the striations, even the fact that a massive rock sits in a sea of sand all make the monolith stand out. But how did it come to look like that? Why is it red and stripy? What can the formation of Uluru tell us about the rest of our country's geology? Uluru reaches almost 350 metres high, more than three kilometres long, and it points more than two kilometres across. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. The structure extends several kilometres below the surface. For Aboriginal people, Uluru is an incredibly special site, with a number of dreaming stories describing the formation of the rock. The geological story of Uluru begins somewhere around half a billion years ago, at a time when planet Earth looked like a very different place. Around this time, tectonic shifts were thrusting the Peterman Ranges up into the sky across the centre of Australia. These ranges were similar in size and scale to the Alps today. Over time, the granite was eroded mixed with sand by an inland river system that flowed into the region. And this mixed sediment was spread out over a vast area until there was no mountain left. Over time, an inland sea, now known as the Amadeus Basin, formed over the centre of Australia. By around 400 million years ago, at the bottom of this sea, the sand and gravel were being compressed into a new sedimentary rock. Over time, these sediment layers built up. And then these rocks were squished together into different folds, which is why we have these striations or little ribs running vertically down the side. If you bend a coat hanger, you can see that the pressure is greatest at the apex of the bend. It's thought that the Uluru we see today was the apex of a particularly tight fold like this, and that the pressure of that fold fused it together, making it harder than the material around it. Over time, the sea drained and the softer rock and the sand around Uluru eroded away, revealing the monolith we see today. Katajuta, although it's made from a slightly different type of rock, was formed in a similar way, but with a less dramatic tilt. So it's all a really complex set of processes. What do you think happened next? What processes continue to shape Uluru and Katajuta? Have a think. What else can you find out about these landforms? What is their cultural significance for the local Anangu? Why are they valued and how are they managed today?